sorry for the delay. Thanks everyone for being flexible. Welcome to our design business rapid fire Q and A. Um, we are gonna jump right in. I'm Gila, I'm the CEO and founder of Spoke. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, Spoke is a design club for designers of all levels. We've got a school, we've got tools, we've got a community. It's a really fun place to be. Um, Lisa, I wanna give a quick intro. I'm Lisa, um, Spoke community probably, if you're familiar with Spoke sessions, you probably have seen my face before. Um, I own my own design firm and I'm also intricately involved in the development of Bespoke School. Um, so all things design and um, interiors as it relates to Spoke and me is why I'm here today. Amazing. Okay, so we have a bunch of questions from the community and we to start we have some icebreakers that they came up with. What was your first job? I taught an arts and crafts course for kids at a summer camp. That's really cute. <laughs> we made I, bags out of denim, like out of like whoa, pair of jeans. That's like uh, really crafty and trendy. Dang. It's on brand. What was yours? I was a tutor. <laughs> that makes so much sense. That makes so much sense. What did you tutor in? Um, primarily math. And then I had one. So I'm from Israel. I don't know how many people know that about me. And so I grew up speaking Hebrew at home and I grew, but I also grew up in Minnesota and like not many people in Minnesota speak Hebrew. And we had someone when I was like 14, a young family moved to the, uh, to Minnesota and their daughter didn't speak any English. And so I was her like translator at school. That's incredible. <laughs> Super cute. That's amazing. Um, so, all right. I'll do the next one. Um, a quick 30 second rundown of how I got to where I am in my career, which I know, which is why the beauty of today's session is that all three of us have very different, um, you know, trajectories from into our careers now, but mine was probably more on the traditional design path. I had a very um, uh, art loving, design loving family that I grew up in. My father's an architect and we um, were always you know, involved in the arts and going to museums and things of that nature. So I majored when I, you know, long story short, I went to college and I, I thought I was going to be a fine artist. I found interior design program there and pursued a double major. Um, and then, you know, after that, I got my master's in art business and decided if I wanted to go into galleries or auction houses or be a designer, obviously I chose design, um, worked professionally for firms in New York City uh, for a bunch of years. And then I decided to jump ship and start my own firm, which is um, fairly typical for people, you know, who ultimately started an undergrad for design. Um, but it's not the, I think it's, it's definitely not the way of the world now, which I think is, which is why I, I have such an affinity for Spoke and all of its members, because I, I really appreciate the non-traditional path. And Gila, you, you so want to tell about now. your 30 second rundown of how you yeah. got to become the founder of Spoke? Sure. Yeah. So I, my background is in tech, so I'm actually not an interior designer. I'm not professionally trained and that's a large reason why I ended up starting Spoke, but basically my background is in, is in tech. I was a product manager. I don't know how many people know what that is, but basically you do like the strategy and creative around tech features. I worked at Bonobos, the menswear company, and before Bonobos, I was at Guilt Group. And before Guilt Group, I was at like a really small Israeli startup in New York that did video. Um, and basically I fell in love with interior design when I moved in with my now husband in New York. This is the first time I like actually had enough space to really decorate. Um, and for some reason, I never really thought of interior design as a career. I don't know why. Like I felt like it always felt like it wasn't an option for me. I, I'm not sure why. Um, so I fell in love with design and just felt like at the time, actually, I was doing like a bunch of arts and crafts. I was selling things on Etsy. I like really loved making things with my hands. And so design felt to me like a really obvious additional hobby. Um, but on the contrary to like pottery and painting and all of those other creative pursuits, there was like no way to actually practice it, like to actually do yeah. anything with it short of spending thousands of dollars and going to a design school or um, basically staring at Pinterest all day. 
So I felt like, listen, I know how to build tech products and this is a big problem. I think a lot of people love interior design and don't really know what else to do about that. Right. Yeah. Um, so I set out to fix it and that's where Spoke came. Amazing. And I think so, you're solving that problem for a lot of people right now, honestly, thank you. myself you're included. <laughs> Well, you, I mean, you, there, there, there are tricks that we at all levels, I think can use spoke for, I mean, I, I obviously, yeah. but I'm biased. Should okay, we wait for gonna, Madeline to you know, we're continue? Gonna come here. Oh, she's here. Where'd she I'm here? I've been here. Hey lady. Okay. You want to give a quick oh. introduction and say hi? Yeah, sure. I'm Madeline. Um, hi. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I work full time as a fashion influencer and then um, I'm kind of a design hobbyist on the side. Amazing. Okay, we're gonna, we have a bunch of questions lined up, but I'm pretty sure, like, not confident because I feel I'm a grandma and, like, not great at Zoom, but I'm pretty sure you can ask questions. So we'll see. But if not, just chime in and ask. This is open, it's fun, it's casual. And we have a bunch of questions you guys already submitted. So we are just gonna go right through them. First question. Was there a point when you knew you were ready to start your own business? I can go first. <laughs> um, no, I think the short answer is that it's never like a great time to uproot your whole life. Like it will never feel like the right time. I think in my yeah. opinion, for me personally, um, I think just one day I felt I had enough courage to do it, but I don't think there was like, I was, I don't think there was some sign. Um, I think it, it also obviously depends on your financial freedom. Like you have to save up, mm -hmm. but I think like, you know, short of being able to literally afford it. Um, I didn't feel like there was a, a big moment for me. Yeah. I feel like there's never a right time, but I definitely think financials have something to do with it. Like uh, I think once you know you have at least a couple months of buffer is a probably a good time. I mean, that's what I did. But I, at the same time, I don't think there's ever enough backing you can have because you don't know what's going to happen. It's such a risk. Um, and that's part of the beauty of it. But if you have what you feel is substantial enough to support yourself for a couple months while you figure things out, then, you know, you, there could always be more. So you might as well go for it. But I, I, I was, I'm not the right person to ask for this question. Because <laughs> I, like, I feel like, I feel like I just like, I went a little rogue. It wasn't like premeditated. It was just like, I'm doing it. And then yeah. I just jumped ship and I figured it out after but that's, that. I think that's what everyone does. Madeline, what was your experience? Um, well, I was lucky enough to, I was working actually corporate America when I um, quit <laughs> and went freelance. <laughs> But at that point it was like blogging, but yeah, I was literally working at like a fortune 500 company and no. I, yeah, I worked at, I worked, I was, I mean, I worked full-time at Target, like in, oh my in God, of course you're from, we're both from Minnesota. This is yeah, like what in Minnesota. Yeah. Um, and I did apparel design there, um, and then switched over and did in-house marketing and was doing, um, art direction for social media. And that's like kind of right around, it was like 2015. So it was right when all of the um, blogging influencer thing that just, you could make money doing that. So I was lucky enough that I negotiated a package out of target. So I had like a nest egg leaving and I was already making some money there. So it was kind of a, a bit of, it was a smooth transition. And then in terms yeah. of like, because now with the design stuff or taking on design clients, I, it's just, it's been easy because I already work for myself. So I'm just yeah. kind of like weaving that into it. So uh, it's for me, it was like, yeah, it was just like, for me, it was just like a really organic shift. Yeah. I think it's definitely, if, if at all possible, the best case scenario is to do it where it's like a very slow progression instead of like a zero to 100 overnight. Mm -hmm. I think both yeah. Madeline and Lisa probably had that luxury more so than I did with Spoke because there was no like slow way to start a tech company but I think yeah. for Madeline and Lisa it's probably a different story yeah tech um, is totally different yeah so I, I just like a heads up probably for this whole q and I'm gonna have very different answers than Madeline and Lisa I know you guys are more interested in the Madeline and Lisa story so <laughs> I will just try to keep my answers to a minimum um any tips on getting your name and brand out there 
talk to everybody. Yeah, word of mouth, really. Talk to everyone, be polite, follow up. Um, yeah. That's what I would say. Yeah, the so calls and emails, go to events when they come back. Yeah. yeah. Again, the best advice that I got was to go like find your target demographic or like find your communities either online or offline and then like show up there. Like if the people who you would hire you are like on, on Reddit, then go to Reddit. If they're on in Facebook groups, go to Facebook groups. If they're on IG, like Interest. certain in, Instagram accounts, yeah. then like be, be active on those Instagram accounts, show up, make it really easy for them to find you. Yeah. If, if you're launching a, a more of a tech company like like me then it comes down a lot to ads and like having a great yeah. land page and things like that but I think for design um jobs is a lot about relationship building like you yeah. you anyway can't have thousands of clients so it's yeah no Sorry, I mean Matt. any clients that I've gotten have been very like um through social media or word of mouth agree and, and that Pretty much it. Yeah. And then I will say for the fashion side of things, like to start working with one of the best things I did there was um, paying for PR. You did? So like, I did. Yeah, I did with the fashion side um, because I was, yeah. And it's kind of something that a lot of influencers don't talk about, um, yeah. but I was lucky enough to, and so I wonder if like that would help in the design world too. I haven't explored that option personally. But in the fashion world, yeah, there's, um, because so many of the brands and your relationships are based in Paris, if you don't have someone in Paris that's like taking meetings on your behalf and stuff like that, it can be really difficult to get a leg up for luxury brands. So well, that makes, that makes sense. Do you, do, you, you, do you pay for PR, Lisa? No, and I, I don't at all. Um, I explored that avenue a, a year or two ago when I was, uh, when my first restaurant that I designed independently was launching, I explored it because I thought that maybe that would be a really great time to pay for press. And ultimately I was turned down from some of these firms because yeah. of, because they asked me, how do I get most of my business? And I said, word of mouth. And they said, well, you could pay us, you know, a big lump sum of money for us to press this, push this one project or you can continue doing what you're doing and it will happen organically, which sounds like, it, you know, it, it sounded like a little bit far-fetched initially, but, you know, I'm glad that I listened to them and I did not pay. And I have to say from just like, like finding those quotes from various PR firms that are specific to the architecture and design industry, it's expensive. Like it's really yeah. expensive. Yeah. And I would, expensive. I would not, I would not recommend that to anyone unless you are really established or have a very specific goal for what that press, mm -hmm. you know, is looking, what you want that press to achieve. Yeah, and I think specifically for the design industry at this point, because I think to Madeline's point, like for her, she needed it to get in front of brands, but we're yeah. talking about yeah. getting in front of clients, which is clients. a very different- clients, I don't know that I would, yeah, I don't know that I would pursue that as well, Lisa. It just doesn't really, it doesn't seem to make sense to me. And I just think as you continue in this world, you meet the press people and so if yeah. you have projects that you want to push you just email them you know it's yeah. like oh I have my girl at like domino now you know yeah, yeah. and so you just keep those relationships going and then I think you're it's fine you know it, it happens organically and it's based on relationship yeah and I think and, for interior design especially most of your clients come like almost every designer we've spoken to interviewed spoke members etc like all of yeah. their clients come from friends and word of mouth that press yeah does very little other than like gives you a logo you can throw on your website so if that's what you want it for then that's like then then know that and treat that differently than like hoping press will get you thousands of clients because yeah because it won't, yeah. it won't. It might yeah. and I, I do have to say that that there are I know a lot of designers in the industry that do pay for press um and I don't think there's anything wrong with it you know just you know just to look at the other side of it it's just it's for a totally different I think outcome than what it sounds like Madeline or I are looking to achieve yeah. yeah, and Spoke doesn't have a PR person, so yeah. we don't do that. We do it um, ourselves. I'm, I, I'm <laughs> Spoke's PR agency. I cold email press, basically, and I make sometimes Lisa and Madeline do it for me, and that's basically it. Um, okay, well, the, the next question is, how do you find clients? But I do feel like we've covered that a little bit, like just kind of showing yeah. up and, and pushing your um, People who are looking for a career change but not sure where or how to start. Any advice? Yeah. 
I have, I have advice. Um, <laughs> I just think for me personally, cause I'm, you know, in this kind of process of shifting from fashion to design or kind of doing both. I don't really ever want to leave fashion completely behind, but there might be a time where I'm not going to fashion weeks or things like that anymore. Um, and for me, that shifts and any career shift in, I mean, I'm 31. So in my twenties, I'm relatively young still, um, has, um, my main advice that I take away and that I tell people is to look for the invitation, to listen for the invitation. To me, anything in my career and any move I've made has literally come by invite, um, not by me pursuing it, but by, you know, just like if you're looking for a career shift, what do people tell you you're good at? What do people say to you? Oh, have you ever thought about doing that? And for me, the interior design world and that door opening was literally because someone came into my apartment at one point and thought, you're good at this. Have you ever thought about doing it? And I was like, no, but now I am, you know? And so it's just, I think you should just really pay attention to where, what you do on your free time, where, how you waste time. You know, I would like avoid shooting Instagram projects because I would be like redesigning my bedroom. And so I was just like wasting time looking for things, sourcing product and going to vintage shops. And I think that was when, yeah, I think you just, you just kind of, you need to open your eyes and open your ears and pay attention to yeah. those little cues because you will tell yourself what you should do and where you should move. I think also that that's awesome advice and I completely agree. I think also just by the way, I can actually see your questions when you submit in the chat. So you can ask questions yeah. through there. I can see them and I'll ask. Um, but yeah, I think for, I think along like with Madeline's advice, I think the other thing that I feel specifically is also just asking yourself what you want, like manifesting what you want out of your day to day. Like what are the challenges you're solving? What does your life look like? Who is your boss? How does it, I think, I think you'll start to answer your, your own questions. Like for example, just kind of envisioning like what it is that you actually want out of that career yeah. change, not necessarily what the job is, but like how it works. Like how it, do you how it, and, I mean, not to get all, you know, LA and woo woo, but it does depend on, it depends a lot on your like manifestation style and stuff, you know, if envisioning or being detailed or all of that, but yeah, it, but like both are very helpful practices of like, what yeah. does it feel like this, like ideal working situation? How does it make you feel? Or like, what are the details? Like you said, who is your boss and stuff? I yeah, agree. you have to work back from like the lifestyle. And exactly. I mean, you have to think about like the big picture. Like if I did this, I, if I made this jump, what do yeah. I want it to look like in a year from now and two years from now? And do I like that? Do I like the fact that I won't be going into an office or have like a cohort of coworkers? And exactly. thinking about, the, the, I think the holistic picture, once you get through like the curiosity phase of it, because I completely agree with Madeline, like you're, you're not going to just make yourself like everybody has ambitions, I think, for a, a, to be a lot of things. And there's a lot of appreciation, I think, right now, especially for different types of career paths. So it's, speaking to design specifically, I think it's a lot about like, what are you, can I do this? Do I, do I appreciate this? Do I enjoy my time when I'm exploring this? And then it's all about, I think, educating yourself on all areas of it. Like what, reading a lot, um, coming to sessions like this, looking, you know, becoming a member of Spoke and exploring like, like the preliminary levels of what interior design is, you know, kind of just getting your, your feet wet a little bit, because I personally had thought I was going to be like a hundred different things, like even while being a designer. And then I kind of go down those paths a little bit and like, do I really like this? And sometimes it's like, no, but I really like it as a hobby. And, and, that, and you know, in the buck stops and there. So in that like I didn't want to be an interior designer if I did that's what I would be doing right I knew right. that I wanted to be an interior design but in my own way and I think Lisa Madeline and I are all for example our own bosses but yeah. our lifestyle and like day-to-day -day is extremely different right and we're all our own bosses in the interior design world so I think like you have to it's one thing to be like, oh, okay, I really want to get into interior design. Like the world is telling me that like, that's a calling of mine. But then I think there's another exercise, which is like, what do you want your work-life balance to be? Who do you want your customers to be? Are they, are you a client business? Are you a service business? Are you a tech business? Like what, what are you actually excited to spend your whole day doing? That's a really good point. There's so many facets of interior design. So maybe you don't want to be specifically an interior designer. Maybe you want to work for a vendor or you want to work in textiles or carpet or- 
like a photo stylist. Or you want to be a stylist or you want to yeah. be an interior photographer. I think that there's a lot of different avenues within this big umbrella. Okay, next complicated question that I know all three of us have dealt with. Sometimes friends can become your clients or customers. <sighs> How do you recommend maintaining boundaries? Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 treat them like any other client. Just treat them yeah, like a yeah. client. Just, yeah. just find those boundaries and say, hey, mom, sister, like, you know, friend. Mom. <laughs> you know like mom you have to pay me for design. mom this is your this is your contract mom this is the proposed yeah. like this is your invoice mom, mom these you- are how many hours i dedicate it to your project and i think once they see that it's not a hobby hopefully they take the hint and they treat you like the designer that they would have hired if it wasn't somebody that they were related to or friendly with yeah that's my two cents i think that's smart for sure it's hard though it is hard it's very hard to have those boundaries and I feel like I constantly have a field of texts coming in that are just like do you like this or this or this oh yeah. you know and like just like random random Instagram followers will send me like full tours of their home and be like what should I do and I'm like hi you can do a consultation (laughs) you know like because I don't know (laughs) like well this is actually like this is actually a topic I'm super passionate about because this is a huge reason I build spoke like this is a big thing about um because we wanted to basically make really talented design hobbyists feel legitimized and monetizing their own talent like yeah. I think it comes I think the more to Lisa's point the more you put your foot down that it is actually something you do for work or that you do for money it doesn't have to be your full-time job by the way big proponent yeah. of a side um yeah. that it then people will buy into it like they buy what you sell right and exactly. I think that the way Etsy, like basically made it so that if you had an Etsy shop for example and and made pottery as a hobby your friends wouldn't ask you for free vases or free mugs because they would buy it from you off your Etsy page, right? And like, that's right. basically what the, a huge problem that Spoke is trying to solve with portfolios and with giving you all those classes about how to charge and how to charge your friends and how to charge clients and like learning how to price yourself because it's super important that you can be like, oh, you want to hire me? You want to ask me about rugs? Like I have a design consultation. You can, here's my portfolio, like just check out and be done with it. And I think it's, yeah, it's about making sure that you, set your own boundary like if you're like and think about it and I think this is one of the biggest problems with the interior design industry which is why again Spoke tried to solve all of it because other industries have solved it like if your friend's a chef you go eat at their restaurant right you don't ask them to cook for you for free Mm, well I do (laughs) (laughs) with my chef friend for sure I'm like yeah well then maybe Maybe you owe her some design consultations. Then yeah, yeah, yeah. She texts me anytime. I'm also designing her a restaurant for free. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. See, then it, then it's, Me yeah, cool. then it's get over that. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I also just think, you know, I, I just keep boundaries and I'll just say like, I'm, I'm like, I'm swamped. I can't answer this right now, but like, let's have wine and chat about it over the weekend or something like that, you know? Or to just be like, listen, I'm, I'm X dollars per hour. Like happy yeah. to like like click here to buy a package right I think if you don't have something like you know a website or a portfolio or your spoke portfolio or something to share it definitely puts a lot of the pressure on you to have to do it over words right to have to be oh uh, can you Venmo me like $30 for this and that's super awkward for you so like giving you a platform so you can be like oh here just like you can choose which one you want and buy it is a very different um, it mm-hmm. takes a lot of the pressure off of you, I think, personally, to set those boundaries. But yeah, yeah. you you set the tone. Like they follow you, and don't if you don't want to give away work for free, then don't give away work for free. Just don't do it. Well, just don't start it. Yeah, yeah. Like because I have to say, like once you open that can of worms, it's truly a can of worms. So just keep coming. And so it's like you have yeah. to find what you're comfortable doing. And like for me personally, what I do especially with friends and family is I'll be like, is, can I answer this question in 10 minutes or less? Yeah. And if I can do this in 10 minutes or less, because I care about you and you're my friend or my family, I will give you the time and energy that it takes to answer this thoughtfully. If it's going to take me more than 10 minutes, I will be like, okay, this is the situation. This is when I have time for it. And like, if it's greater than this, you're, I'm gonna have to treat you like a project and or a client. 
And usually they're like, okay, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Or they'll be like, okay, I'll take the 10 minutes. So you don't know what you're going to get, but I think just having some sort of like soft, you know, guidelines for yourself. So when this Mm -hmm. pops up, you can like hold true to that because it does get overwhelming when you're being like, you're caught off guard. Okay. We had two quick questions from the group. The first was what happens if you're actually trying to build a portfolio, like in the very beginning? Mm, that's a good I question. We have thoughts yeah. on this, yeah. but I'll yeah. let you two go first. Go ahead, Madeline. I mean, from personal experience, I, I started with just like very minimal rates. So I was still like making something, but I think like I took on my first design projects charging like 1500, you know, for like furnishing a six room house. Um, and it was a lot of work and I'm, I'm slowly building. I've just been over the last year, like slowly building up rates, um, or charging more and attracting kind of clients that have those bigger budgets and can pay more. I also do have a bit of like a sliding scale that I'm willing to go on, depending on how much work I think the project will be or how many hours I think I'm going to be putting into it. I mean, but man, once clients get your cell phone number, it's like game over. (laughs) <laughs> it's just like they're they just oh my god they're just constantly texting me and I'm like it's fine and I don't mind but it's like I'm not I'm not char- charging hourly at this point I'm charging like design fees and I'm still working out how to like charge more and make more because I don't make like there is no way I could make a, I'm not making it on my design work right now like I'm not making a salary um so I'm still figuring that out I guess but I do think it is important to like take on projects that are great. Like I have a friend who's a chef in Minnesota and is building a beautiful restaurant and I'm doing it for free. And because I know that it's going to be like such a great thing to have in, in my portfolio. Um, and because I'm excited about it and because I love her. And so it's like, there's mutual benefits there, but. Yeah. You have to do you, like Lisa and I always say in, in these classes we've done before on like pricing and charging that you like, as long as you can walk away with your head held high, that like you didn't, you know, do anything that made you feel like you, um, like gave away, like, like you respect how you handled the situation and you're proud of what came out of it, then it doesn't, then who cares, right? Then, then it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's like, I think you just need to start to like, um, you know, just like figure out like, is this going to be worth it? Is it something that I'm going to be able to like, do, is the budget high enough? Like I have people that come to me and they're like, yeah, I want to refresh my New York apartment. My budget's $5,000. And I'm like, there's, I can, I'll, I can get, I can pick you out a new couch. You know, it's like, there's not, there's not much, you can't work, you know, it's like, you can't do much with that. I think in the um, beginning though, when you, when you're trying to answer the, to answer the question super specifically too, is like yeah. when you're trying to build a portfolio and you're maybe starting from literally zero, zero. projects, mm-hmm. it, you do have to be a little bit more of like the, yeah, you say yes yeah, to more things, yes. exactly. like including, including, you know, parents and siblings and in-laws because mm-hmm. those will life. be the things that will, you know, give you something to add to your portfolio. You can photograph it yourself and, you know, edit the images and throw them on a website or throw them on your spoke portfolio. And it will give you something that is substantial to, to, that is even just a talking point. Um, And so you you say yes a lot. And then eventually over time you, you get the, you earn the luxury of saying no. Yeah. That's my, I said yes to everything the first year that I started. And I think that's really, really important ranging from like getting paid a thousand to 500 yeah like you know to like then finally charging something like above three thousand for a project exactly yeah and then i think even when you say everything when you say yes to those small projects too outside of the portfolio experience that it's going to give you it's going to give you so much business experience and confidence in talking about how you charge and talking about like and, and standing behind what you charge and understanding what your time is like really valued at like oh I thought this was gonna I think Madeline and I talked about this offline before like yeah. oh I thought the project was gonna take me 20 hours but it really took me 50 hours but I'm only getting paid for 20 hours so you learn and the next time yeah. you you see these red flags earlier so yeah. it's yeah. really important to say yes 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 and gain the confidence that you need and the portfolio work that you are desiring and then yeah. it will it will push you forward like there's no way it's not yeah exactly and if you're- Specifically, just trying to build a portfolio, then 
truly like if you join spoke we give you practice yeah. prompts as part of our curriculum as part of our spoke school and then you can add those practice projects we give you like a full client who has requirements and a budget it's like a, for all intents and purposes a real project and then you can yeah. literally add them to your portfolio like there's no need if, if you're if, if you already feel that you like have the design talent to take on clients and all you're lacking is a portfolio to show that off then just come hang out with spoke and make a portfolio like it, it doesn't have to be real clients to show that you have the chops to do it um if it's more and the job the, fair yeah that's also true we have a job fair so you can literally apply for jobs Look but yeah yeah, but if it's about actually building the confidence on rates, then yeah, like anything, I mean, you can't come out of the gates and be like, you know, I'm a thousand dollars an hour, like things take time. I think is the only cautionary tale I would say to saying yes, is that it has to be a yes, because you believe that doing it is going to get you closer to your goal. If it's yeah. like a sidestep, because you, for some reason, think it might open some other door for you, but it will come at a great personal expense. Like it's not the right time to say yes. I just have to say that because being a yes person can also destroy you <laughs> yeah, yeah it can lead to a lot of just getting taken advantage of <laughs> yes we have a bunch of questions about people yeah. asking like literally how to charge like which pricing model and at what price and I'm just going to say that we have so many classes about that in school so I yeah. do, and I'm very subjective like Lisa literally gives a framework for yeah. how to charge given your experience and at what rate in one of our classes so I don't know if we want to dive into yeah. it here I don't think we need to dive into that I think I think it's just, yeah, take that course. And then as far as the starting range is concerned, I think just, it, and we, we address this, it really just depends on where you are, like literally what your location is. What is, okay, I'm just double checking. Someone asked where you guys get your inspiration from for design projects and like brands. Well, before COVID traveling and, ex yeah. and you know, experiences generally like galleries museums travel different cultures you know just things that are outside of my you know my grasp literally was always and still is my number one inspo and I think second to that um honestly like vintage design books I have so many of them and it's just so interesting to see how things just get recycled um I guess it's very similar with fashion right Madeline in so many ways yeah totally a lot gets recycled and I would say too like you know I always like to start with a good like Pinterest deep dive mm. you know Pinterest can be really helpful traveling was always great um Honestly, I just even get inspired, like, or inspired, like walking through like Home Depot and just being like, oh, look at that interesting material, you know, like weirdly. I take a lot of my inspiration for interiors from fashion, I would say, I say, I would think. Yeah, just color combinations, materials, um, like pattern mixing. I think fashion and in the interior world goes very, very hand, hand in hand. But at the same time, as someone that um, I would call my interiors not like, I mean, they're not super bold, but they're not subtle, but I dress very subtle. <laughs> so it's like, it's, I don't know. It's interesting that way. Yeah. I would say both, but I, I see the connection for you, Madeline, between your um, interior style and your fashion sense. For yeah, I mean, I think, I think we all have that when you have like your own taste. I'm level literally level matching level. my sofa. <laughs> so, I couldn't be more. I just think like, I, I, I like to put a lot more color and pattern into my interiors than I do into my wardrobe, which is yeah, interesting. Fair. I'm the complete but, opposite. Are you? My interiors are pretty clean, simple, yeah. not a lot of pattern. And then like, I love a good pattern and like a dress. Like I like the pieces, I buy the pieces that like, you're like, I can wear that once in an entire year. Like that's, yeah. those are the you're things like, that, that I That is love. my on the coast of Italy dress. And <laughs> yeah. But I do have to say, we are literally all matching our interiors right now. So, <laughs> do you know, it's funny when I was in design school, my first year and I did my first design presentation, um, my professor said to us, when you're giving your presentation, make sure that you look like what you're presenting. And so that everybody came in literally matching their presentation vibe. And I was like, this is kind of creepy, but it, but ultimately I think it's a good way to, you know, express yourself in another medium, which. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Next, 
quick one. One thing that surprised you about being an entrepreneur or having your own business that you didn't know before. Keila, you go first. <laughs> I have so many. I know. That's why I think you should go first. <laughs> Um, okay, let me see. I think the biggest thing, again, mine is very different because I'm um, a tech, it's a tech business, which is really different than what they do. But I would say that I knew it was going to be really difficult. Like, I don't think I had any um, romantic ideas of what it was going to be like, but I thought it was going to be difficult because like the problems were going to be really hard to solve. And that was going to be like taxing for me. Yeah. And in reality, the solving problems is actually what what ended up for me personally giving me a lot of energy the part that is so difficult is the emotional side of it like how unbelievably intertwined with your self-worth your company becomes um and how difficult it is to manage like customer service emails and mean people <laughs> and rejection and because it's when you're when it's also your company there is just no no clear way at least without a lot of therapy to like understand what the difference is between someone I think also especially for me for Spoke because Spoke came out of such a deep personal passion and interest of mine like I was building it for people like me it probably is different for people building tech products that are like you know email software because I don't think you get as emotionally attached but who I don't know who's to say um so that has definitely been like a huge takeaway for me I would that's mine there's a lot more where that came from but I'll let Lisa and Madeline go next Madeline. Um, <laughs> I mean I think for me as like I've kind of I went from like working solely by myself to like shooting whatever clothes I wanted to to now working with clients and that's been a really big adjustment um client work is hard <laughs> yeah working for and other it's people like, it's very hard it's very yeah. hard and like doing people's homes is like like such a fun and rewarding process but I also feel like I'm like a therapist like you are no one told you that no, I know <laughs> I like literally had to get a therapist because I was like I can't deal with this <laughs> um because it's just like yeah it's like it's so much and i i love this the cancer i have a cancer moon so my cancer moon is like let me build you a beautiful home but it's like so much emotional energy and there's like so much that i pour into it that like it's it's tough it's really tough and i've yeah, been really surprised by that over the last year of doing it it is not a glamorous job no like no I was like, ooh, yeah, interior design, this is fun. And now I'm like, ooh, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> like, um, That's amazing. Yeah, and I just feel like I feel personally totally unprepared. Um, I wish I went to school for it. And I'm trying to like catch up while I'm trying to balance clients. And I feel like I might actually like not take on any clients for a good chunk of like the summer just so I can like learn and feel like I know what I'm doing. Cause I didn't really take that time to do that because I was just kind of threw myself into it. And now I feel the need to kind of be like, okay, wait, I need to like take a step back and like actually understand the process of how to build this as a business. And if I want to, because that shit is hard. <laughs> yeah. That goes, that goes back to that. What we were saying earlier about like not knowing what you want your career change to be like, ask yourself these questions. Like, do yeah. you want clients to be who like your, your business model or do you want a different, you know, there's ways, for example, like, for example, to be an influencer in the home space where all you're sharing is your own space. So like you have, you do have to ask yourself these questions. Way easier, way easier. <laughs> I will say. <laughs> I think also let's like not like totally mystify this role of interior design in any way that like oh like once you start a business you're just going to be like looking for clients and getting design work and because I, I think that the biggest challenge and the obvious one that I felt when I saw this question was you are a part-time everything like you are a you part-time HR you're part-time accounting you're part-time attorney you're part-time janitor you're part-time organizer you are a spreadsheet guru you are 
you are your receptionist, you know, you are your shipper. Like when you start a business, you literally wear every single hat. Like think of a hat, you're wearing that hat, you know, like, and that is something that I think gets overwhelming because even the, like the women who work for me, I have to constantly remind them and myself at the same time, like when we are in the weeds of a project, we are doing probably 10% creative work at that point and 90% administrative work. So when you are a designer, it, like, and you're running your own firm and you have your own projects and you have your own clients and whatnot, it's really hard to remind yourself every time why you're doing it. And that's usually so you can do that 10 to 20% of the time creative work because mm -hmm. it's not the opposite. It's just, I mean, I'm sure in some the firms and in some world that is the opposite but I think when you're starting a business it's just it's it's not about the design work initially yeah yeah it's probably not for you if you like hate context switching and yeah hate that's a good point spreadsheet if you hate spreadsheets like if you don't love spreadsheets I wouldn't recommend entrepreneurship <laughs> I would say yeah uh, Lisa loves her way around a spreadsheet my I girl <laughs> loves spreadsheets and color yeah. coding oh and yeah color. I'm, a, I'm a google a google sheets girl oh yeah mm -hmm. yes. okay what is the hardest part of being a woman in business oh this question you oh, have to work hard. twice as hard to get half the opportunities especially in tech oh i can That's only imagine for tech especially no one takes it seriously it's all yeah it's you work very very hard to be taken seriously that would be my answer much harder than most other people and all the traits that are celebrated I mean this everyone knows this as a woman but all the traits that are celebrated in men uh business founders and leaders are um frowned upon, you frowned upon for women yeah yeah so if I argue with someone, if I hold my ground, if I am bossy, um, which I don't think is an insult, by the way, it uh, works against me. And no, no founder can be agreeable. Like that's ju it's just that like yeah. it, you can't run a business and also be agreeable. So you're basically like fighting a paradox, I would say. But it's possible. <laughs> don't give up. <laughs> We're all here and we lean on each other a lot. Can't tell you how many times I cry to Madeline and Lisa. Like, you know, you, you find your, you find your gang and you hold on to them very tightly. Yeah. For sure. It, I will say it's gotten, I mean, we are lucky and privileged that it's gotten that much more possible for women Definitely. in the last like few decades, you know, like the stuff that I think the business that I'm running, I know my mom like struggled to run in the 80s you know to just try and do any like work on her own in any part but yeah so I do think it's getting easier um but it's still not easy no I agree and I, I mean it's unfortunate that this is even a question that we have to talk about but it's very real and I think it's an important one to discuss um because like when I started my business I think I just turned 27. I'm 32 now. And I had clients that hired me and I went into their conference room and it was all men that looked 60 plus. Like they looked like they could be my dad. Um, and I was the only woman in the room and I had to present to these people and they had to critique me and approve me. Oh. And it was so ick it's like that that like vomiting emoji like that is how I felt oh. a lot um I'm actually having like physical side effects listening to this but it happened all the time you know and it was it was only until the last couple of years where there started to be more women in the boardroom more women as my direct contacts um for my commercial and hospitality clients and I think it's it's inevitable that no matter what realm of design you're working in I'm going to stick to design because I know this is applicable to so many other avenues um but in design, you know, more likely than not, you're going to have a mix of male and female or specifically, I think, male um, uh, clients in, in hospitality and commercial work. And when I deal with that, I think it's, it's important to remind yourself when you're feeling a little insecure, as I often did, like, and I still do, 
that they hire you for a reason, that you're there for a reason, that they're, you know, they're judging you on your work, not, you know, your gender, um, hopefully. And to just keep it as professional as you can. And when you get challenged by that, I think it's important to lean into your, your cohort of people, uh, you know, your supporters, whoever they may be, um, because it, it, it's a real feeling to feel marginalized, I think, as a woman, especially in a male dominated world, which I deal with a lot, which is resident, uh, real estate development. So um, stay true to yourself. It's harder than it sounds, but it's important. Um, and if something doesn't feel right, it probably isn't right. And that's my if, I believe that. <laughs> if any of you are thinking about starting a tech company, please DM or email me directly because I have a lot to say. And especially when it comes to investors and the like, and I can at least be a sounding board or event someone to vent to. Um, being a woman in tech is a real doozy. <laughs> we had a question, speaking of zodiac signs, we had a question of people asking us our spoke signs, which um, I'm a lynx. And I actually have to tell you that when Madeline, which is, you went, you're, you're muted. You're muted. Oh, I'm muted. Yeah. Did you hear me ask the question about spoke signs or did I, was I muted for that? You were muted for that. Oh, I heard the spoke sign, but I didn't hear what. Okay. I was that. saying, Madeline, can I tell the story of your spoke sign experience? <laughs> But now I can't hear her. Is she muted? I don't see her anymore. Oh, she left. Okay. I'm sure she something happened with her computer. I'm sure she'll be right back. Oh, she's back. She's here. Okay. Madeline. I'll give her a second. Okay, I'm a lynx. That's my spoke sign. Um, and I'm a lynx tried and true. Literally super. And I um Lisa, I think you and Madeline are both pixies. I'm a pixies. And I did it like two times and it's gonna work. Yeah, and you both are like, it's very on brand. I want Madeline to unmute so I can tell her, so I can ask her for permission to tell the story of getting her spoke sign. Sorry, I don't know why I popped and muted. But yeah, I just remember I, it was so accurate. Madeline, I was on FaceTime with Madeline when I made her take her spoke sign quiz, and then it was so accurate, she started to cry. <laughs> I was like, I feel so seen. <laughs> I will never forget that moment. I was like, oh my God, I'm saving this story for a future um, when I can make fun of her for it later. So here I am. <laughs> it was so accurate, though. She talked about like, taste levels and like wine drinking, and I was like, yes. <laughs> all of the things. No, if you um, haven't taken that quiz, you should totally take this quiz. It's very, it's fun. I did it and I still get freaked out by its accuracy. It's pretty awesome. I will say, I'll be, I'll be annoying about that. What is your biggest regret with starting your business or, or a regret with a client? Like, do you have a, do you have your, a big regret? Like a juicy story regret? I'm not sure. I didn't, we got this question from someone in the community. I think biggest regret with starting your business or with a client is the question. I think just doing work for free. Mm, like yeah. charge $10 before you do work for free. You know, like it doesn't have to be a ton of money, but get compensated for your time. Madeline, what's yours? I, I think that's pretty accurate. I don't know what else I would add to that, honestly. Um, um, and I would, I maybe would just add like, don't, don't, you know, I think for a big part of, um, having my own business and doing my own thing, especially now working with client work is also, um, taking time to prioritize, like working on myself. Um, because I think your self-worth or self-confidence, especially for a woman and a woman who's running her own business, like meet up with the roadblocks we talked about. It's, it's just really important to not let yourself limit yourself. If that, if that makes sense. Yes, that's a big one. I think mine for me would be that I wish I started my business earlier. I started it when I was 28, like the end of being 28. Um, and I think like the late 20s, early 
that was a couple years ago. I'm no longer 20, just to be clear, 31. But I think the late 20s, early 30s is also a very complicated time, especially for women. Like you're, you feel a lot of pressures and there's a lot of other things happening in the world. And I think I would have, you also like alcohol affects you more. You need more sleep. Like aging is very real. And I, I wish I had started with a, when I had a little bit more energy and like literally no reason not to. Like 25, like golden age for starting a company, in my opinion. Because the first couple of years yeah. when you're fine are really complicated. Um, and it's just, yeah, I wish I would have done it earlier. That's mine. Regret. Okay. For de- interior design specifically, we only have a couple yes. of minutes left. You guys, if anyone tuning in has a question that you want to make sure I answer it, I'll prioritize any that come through the chat. But if not, I'm going to keep going through this list. For interior design, is it better to have your own style or be flexible and go with what your client likes? I think you're always inherently have your own design style. I think like, you know, what what your aesthetic is, what you gravitate towards, what you you like, whether or not you want to classify it as a style. Um, But, and and you will also always be, have to be flexible for your client because there will be times where you need to marry existing pieces with things that you're incorporating. So that might not always be like your perfect, perfect choice of an item. Um, So I think it's a mix of both, like stay true to what your style is and always offer that up first. Um, But you will always be bending a little bit and being flexible on choices because your client's likely not gonna align with you 100%. But they did hire you. Yeah, it's tough too, because I found, I found recently there's been multiple times where I'll present something that I'm really excited about and really happy with. And the client is like, Ooh, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if that's right. Blah, blah, blah. But then eventually when final purchases are made, they end up with a design that's pretty close to what I presented them. Yeah. You know, whether it was like the pink couch that they were like, that's too risky. And then all of a sudden they're like, what do we think about a pink couch? And I'm like, great idea. <laughs> you know, like, and it's like, it surprises me how often that happens you have to take them to we have to bring the client to the water you can't make them drink it so like you show them they give your sign of approval then they think about it then they see all the other pieces and they're like oh you know what we should get rid of that coffee table we should buy a new one yeah yeah yeah. and you just like you kind of it there is that like building of the trust and it's like a total Mm -hmm. collaboration you know it's like I feel like my recent projects maybe especially with projects I'm working on in New York, maybe that's just a New York thing, but man, people are like so invested and it's just like, they want to collaborate on it. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a, one of the biggest myths of the design industry that people think that because a client has hired you, they don't want to be involved. Like that they want you everything. Like people are obsessed with the process. Everyone wants to be involved. Like people care so much about their house, but also everyone fancies themselves to some degree, a bit of a stylist or a designer of their own home. It's very rare to have a client like, I know nothing, run with the whole thing. And to Madeline and Lisa's point, it's really hard also when the pieces come in piecemeal and you're like trying to get them on board with your final vision, but they can't see it happening slowly. Yep. Um, And and there's been a lot of times where they freak out because all of a sudden they've gotten something in the mail or they ordered something or something showed up at their house and they're just like, oh, but like, whoa. And, you know, it's like that in between, I'm not at the point where I'm like buying everything, putting it in a warehouse and then installing in one day, you know, right. like that's not what I'm doing. That would probably be easier because then you wouldn't have that like in between where the client freaks out because they like don't have, they the can't see it all at they once. They can't see it all. And, yeah. they're this piece of mail and they're just like, this looks crazy. And you're like, I know. But trust the process, man. You know, <laughs> like, you should make you. That, should, and that's you, where you come in. Have, with the client you guys should be making busies with this and showing them what the space is going to look like that well, also I, do. I show them all of that but but yeah. man I mean it's just a, a, without 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 a doubt there it's like one thing that just throws them off suddenly in between and then you're into the therapy part of the design yeah you know where do you start when it comes to accessorizing a space favorite places to look I have found so many amazing like Instagram shops via spoke members. Like the spoke members have like some of the most incredible shops. 
I wrote some of them down because I they're new to me and I love them. Uh, I forget what they're some of them are called, but I'll get to that. But anyway, oh, good thanks, LA, mm. and Forgotten Edge, and then there's this other one that wasn't from Spoke, but um, nice vintage things like Instagram stuff is really fun because it's, it's it feels so like fun. you're like yes. bidding in a way, and you're like Literally. getting to it first. Um, but it's also a really cool way to sort that's not like a conventional website. Yep. Yeah. Madeline? Um, I, also, I, I, all the Instagram shops for sure. I've purchased quite a bit off of those. Um, I also love Etsy. Yeah. Because it's just like, you can find some like, I'm everything. really obsessed right now. You can find everything. And you yeah. can kind of negotiate. I'm like super obsessed with like Swedish brutalist metal artwork right now. And the like list is endless on Etsy. And it's just like, this is weird stuff that you like probably wouldn't find anywhere else. <laughs> weird, but I, like, I like it. It. Yeah, it's like, so the, I think that's good too. Cherish is good, but the prices can be high now. The shipping can be high. Shipping can be so high. Oh, I. I actually end up sourcing on Cherish and then trying to find their shop directly and working something you out. You like a good road trip, I learned. I love a good road trip. <laughs> No, um, Facebook Marketplace recently has had some gems too on the East Coast. That is actually Spoke members love Facebook Marketplace. They talk about it a lot in our little Slack community. They yeah. find amazing stuff there. Someone recently found some like insane. I need a member who is on to tell me what they found. They found one of these like really famous pieces and it was going for like a hundred dollars. Like someone had no idea the value of the item that they had. And I can't yeah. remember what it was. Yeah, classic uh, Facebook marketplace. Yeah, eBay too. I've gotten a few things on eBay recently. Some good lighting. I found a set of um, Isabel Lamb silverware, which is like a '90s designer silverware. Normally they sell for like two grand, and I found it for like two hundred bucks. And I was like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> no. Kira, so there's one question that I really want to answer, and it's a really yeah. unsexy answer, but it feels really important to this audience. Yeah, let's do it. Um, it's what do you recommend spending a lot of time on? Go ahead, take it away. Because I, I think your time is super, super valuable when you're starting a business because you have to wear 7 million hats. And this is the least sexy answer, but I'm very passionate about it. And I want to give this tidbit and that's the paperwork because the invoicing, the budgeting, the purchasing, all of that is so essential to building trust with your client. Because once they see that the, their dollars that you are handling are in good order and everything lines up and makes sense and checks out from like this is much I gave you and this is much is spent it is so important to creating trust with your your clients and that is like I think one of the number one ways that I was able to continue and get more business from the same clients because they trust me with their design process and they also trusted me with their money and they know that my um, like the spreadsheets made sense they were organized they could rely on me and I think spend time on that do not get away from that. And to that note, there is a bunch of, or a couple spoke, um, in school, in B -Spoke school. we have goals on this. We're probably going to plan some more goals, some possibly some more spoke sessions. I think it's really, really important because it covers so many different areas of the relationship with your client and helps you become a better organized designer. And I'm very passionate about this. So I really wanted to give you Lisa that love paperwork. <laughs> I, I mean, I love a type A designer. Here I am. <laughs> but it's important. I have yeah, to give that, I have to give that out. Art. It makes me really happy. Lisa's the best. It is. Madeline, what, have, what is your answer? What's a good thing to spend a lot of time on? That was the question, right, Lisa? Yes. The question was, if any, what, if anything, do you recommend is worth spending a lot of time on? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's probably essential for sure. Um, being very organized. Um, I spend a lot of time sourcing um, because I'm like trying to find those like really unique vintage pieces. I end up putting a lot of vintage into clients' homes. I mean, most of my home is vintage. Well, mine would be talking to your customers. Like no amount of data in the world has ever given me as much insight as just talking to my people, my yeah. users. That's helpful. There's no more questions. Anything else? Final thoughts? 
I saw someone say they use PowerPoint for visuals and they should really be using Spoke, Viz, and also our project. Oh yeah, all Viz. Together. Um, okay, thank you all so, so much for this. This was amazing. Sorry about the IG Live debacle. We should all report the fact that it's very annoying. They only roll out features to certain people at certain times. And thank you guys so much, Lisa and Madeline. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This was awesome. Thanks guys. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Bye.